So, um, hi everyone. I'm Anna, and I'm from the Gapminder Foundation. And we're a small nonprofit based in Stockholm, Sweden. And what we're trying to do is to create a fact-based worldview that everyone can understand. And basically, it's all about this, getting these dull numbers into something people can consume and understand. So we started in uh, 2005, and it was me, and then it's Hans Rosling and Ola Rosling. And ha the thing is, I have to mention here, when I was young, my dream was to become independent. I would never marry, never get kids. I would be very cool, I thought. Unfortunately, when I was 16, I met Ola, the guy at the right, and a few years later, I started working together with him and his father. We married early, we have three kids, so complete failure, just so you know. <laughs> but it has been very fun. So we have been trying to make data come alive, so we've been doing t like TED Talks, documentaries, we've been doing these animating bubble charts and different kinds of tools, and we have improved the results when you're searching for public data at the Google. But what we realized is, because we want people to get a fact-based worldview, whenever you are searching, you're giving one small question into the UI, and you get a result back. But that doesn't give you a worldview. You only get a, an answer to your question. And what if that question was the wrong question? You will never know. So we decided to write a book called Factfulness. And it's uh, been out for half a year or something. And it's available in many languages. It's going to be available in 37 languages. So far, it's in 13. They just made it in Finnish. And they decided to change the title into something I cannot translate since I don't know Finnish. Just so you know, if you see the Facto Yen Mali Mailma, it's supposed to uh, be like factfulness, right? So we start the book by asking 13 fact questions. And we sent those out to you, too. And as, as I was actually worrying that this would not be a very polite audience, actually, if you're requested to do something, you would do it. Rather, people here were like, yeah, whatever. I do whatever I like, and I'm busy with all these fun stuff. So we only have 33 people answering, but I'm going to hang out their results anyways. <laughs> so we have been testing this question. So we have the global climate experts believe that over the next 100 years, the average temperature will get warmer, stay the same, or get colder. And of course, get warmer is what the researchers are talking about today. And we tested this in 14 countries, and this was the results. And we can see here the Finnish results. 94% of the Finns actually got this correct. So what about this audience? Here at Slush, 96%, even better than the Finns, even though you're only 33 people, right? So we cannot really say anything about that. So when we ask questions that is about the climate or environments, actually people are getting them pretty well. But as soon as we ask something about something different about the world, they tend to get it pretty bad. So look here, how many of the world's one-year-old children today have been vaccinated against some disease? 20, 50, or 80%. 80% is the correct. Honestly, it's at 88, but we have rounded it downwards to actually be more, so no one can say that we are actually trying to overestimate. And this is the results. We see Sweden at the top, Finland down at 12%, got it right. And just imagine if we went to the zoo instead, asking the chimpanzees who cannot read or write the same question, a, B, C, they would choose between three different bananas, A, B, or C. They would get 33% correct just by taking a random guess. But as soon as humans start thinking, we are, we are seeing a question we don't know the answer of, and we start thinking, starting to be analytical, and then we get it completely wrong. So what about the audience here? Actually pretty good. Better than the chimps. And that is, of course, for the few motivated who answered. So who knows how you the rest of you would have scored. 
but just go with the flow and, and feel happy that you're at least a bit better than the chimp, if that's representative. We have been asking the same question in several different conferences. Just to show you, the World Health Summit, basically the place where decision makers about health are meeting yearly. This is the results from them. 27%, and this is vaccination question, should be somewhat within their area of expertise, you could think. The Davos meeting, 18% got this correct. A meeting in Lindau with Nobel laureates and medical scientists, you know, high achieving ones. 8% got this correct. And then we have one of the five largest banks. They were smart enough to actually have us sign an NDA before they answered. So that, therefore, we, are, we can only say that they are one of the five largest. We're not saying which one. And that's a good thing for them, because they actually scored 4% correct. And just imagine, these are the people who will make the big decisions about the world. And if we get the vaccination question wrong, it actually means something. It says something about how we perceive the world around us. If most kids are being vaccinated in most countries, that means that we have a cold chain working, that we have infrastructure working, that mothers can read and write. It's a lot of things that has to work, actually, customs working and so forth. So probably, when these people are investing for the future, there is a risk that they are doing it in the wrong places. So for this test, we did on representative audiences in 14 countries, and this is how they scored overall. 15% scored zero correct answer. And just imagining, if you have 12 questions, and A, B, C on each of them, and you get zero correct, I mean, that is pretty impressive in its own way. And this is how the rest of the results were formed. And we can see this is where they should be if they would just guess without reading any of the questions. Unfortunately, humans tend to read and think, and then it gets skewed. And here, we have one person who actually got 11 correct answers, and no one got 12. So in this case, only 10% got better scores than the chimps. And that is why we wrote the book, trying to fix that. Here at Slush, the 33 ones answering, <laughs> this was their result. Actually, much, much better than the general public, and 67% better than the chimps. So how can we be this wrong? This is a test, uh, a question that YouGov was posting to the general public in different countries, asking, do you think the world is getting better or worse? It's a very open, general, weird question, but at least it gives a sense where you can see in Sweden, for instance, only 10% are thinking that the world is getting better. And if you have that as a starting point, it's pretty hard to guess something else than picking the worst results. But there are some things that has improved. Legal slavery is down. Fewer people die from disasters we don't have lead in the gasoline in almost any countries anymore. Fewer children are dying before the age of five. Fewer people die in plane crashes. We have more movies to choose from, more kids being vaccinated. We have more music to choose from today, and a bigger portion of the Earth is actually protected. This doesn't mean that the world is in good shape. It doesn't mean that we think everything is fine. But I think it's important to remember that we have actually, over time, achieved quite a lot. But when we look out the window, it's pretty hard to tell, because we cannot see long-term trends and changes. So what do we do then? We go to the news. And what do we see there? We see disasters, wars, refugees, diseases, paradises, cute animals, and exotic cultures. And we try to create a worldview out of that. But the problem is, what we see is extraordinary events. We don't see the everyday lives of people, and we don't see the majority kind of activities. I mean, to become a news story, it has to be something exceptional. So therefore, we try to create some 
explanations, some models to understand the world that, is, that are easy to get. So imagine the world as a street where you have the poorest to the left and the richest to the right and everyone else in between. These are the seven billion people of the world. And when we've asked Swedish general public and students, they think they are here on a global income distribution very often. And imagine you watch the news and you see all these extraordinary events. You look out the window, nothing is happening, and you think you are in the middle of the world income distribution, while by just being in Sweden, you're most likely among the richest. So we created a tool we call the Dollar Street, where we actually send out photographers to homes all over the world to look at how people sleep, eat, play, etc and about 137 other things. And I'm gonna show you briefly here. This is the tool, it's live. Everything we do is free for anyone to use. And what we can do here, you see the street at the top, it says families in the world by income. Uh, let's go here, we can choose beds like this, and we can immediately see what beds look like at different incomes, because these are the 300 families in the 50 countries we've been to, and we can see the gradual change of bedding, depending on from the poorest to the richest we've been to. And we can actually slide in like this and look at the middle income segment. And this is pretty neat, because when Swedes thought they were in the middle, we can just slide and look at just the middle segment of the street and see that this is not the typical Swedish bedroom, most of it. We can go down to the poorer end, not the typical Swedish bedroom either, or we can go up to the top area. And now it starts to look like a Swedish bedroom. But these ones are from Mexico, Netherlands, South Africa, US, United Kingdom, Brazil, and so forth. We can also look at my favorite, which is toilets. That's the good thing with defining your own projects. So you can tell this is really needed. And when we look at these toilets, we can see people tend to like water flushing white porcelain toilets in all these different places. But remember, we are only looking at the richest end. To get a representative sample of the whole world, we should slide out and see whatever toilets might look like globally to get the proportions somewhat right. But of course, not everything works as photos. So, so we're also taking some video snippets of everyday activities like toothbrushing. So one example actually showed up in my mailbox pretty recently. Uh, so this is the one, I don't know if you have ever I'm in the wrong spot, one sec. If you have ever seen this guy, this is Bill Gates brushing his teeth. <laughs> I had a little bit of a problem where to put the house because he should be, I mean, further down the hall, but I put it a little bit on the end. But this is what it looks like about something more representative, starting in the richer end, going backwards, downwards to the poorer end, and we can see people are brushing their teeth in very similar manners independently of where they are. Plastic toothbrush, very serious someone, but still the same activity. Plastic toothbrush and toothpaste. And they do that on all these different income levels because it's a universal thing. But when we come down to the poorest end, people will start using a stick or a finger or something because they cannot afford the toothbrush. So therefore, this image is tagged not only as a wall, it's also tagged as toothpaste, because that is how she is using it. So we can zoom in and look, here is the street again. We have the US population here, and we zoom in a bit. We have visited a fa family here at the top end, which is the Howards. Here's their house. And we have visited a family in the poorer end of the US income spectrum, the Handleys. And now we can look right into their cutlery drawers and we can immediately see the difference. We can add another family and we can see the gradual change from a plastic drawer with a few cutleries to a wooden drawer for cutlery to a wooden drawer with wooden compartments. We can look at kitchen sinks, living rooms, and so forth. We can do it in China as well. Three families on different income levels. Their houses, their sofas, and their stoves. 
So it's important what, uh, to actually stop talking about how people do in China, for instance, or how they are doing in, in Japan or in US or Nigeria, because it will look different depending on where we are on the income level. Cool is when we start comparing across countries. These two families are neighbors in the Dollar Street concept, but not in reality. Look into the bedrooms, pretty similar. Both have brown leather sofas, and they have almost identical plate structures, of course, both made in China. And then we can go down and do the same in the poor end. We zoom in, compare two homes, neighbors at Dollar Street in Nigeria and China. It doesn't look like they have so much in common here, does it? But look at their ceilings. They have straw ceilings with a plastic sheet on it. They have similar plastic chairs being their sofas. They are storing their grains in identical manners. And both are going to have fish for dinner this particular day. And they are boiling their water in identical ways. So when we use photos as data, we can actually get cultural and country stereotypes to fall apart. Because this is a typical way of boiling water if you are on this particular income level. So when we look at Dollar Street, it doesn't look anything like the images we see in the news, because we're focusing on everyday realities. And then sometimes people tell me, isn't it ridiculous that you're sending out photographers and have people volunteer to do these household documentations? Why don't you just Google it? You know, you have tons of imagery. So just to remind you, it's not very representative what you will find. This is a search for toilets, bed, stove, I mean, it's not that these images are lying, it's just that they are not representative for the overall uh, representation of how different economic standards of stoves look like. So to understand the world, I would recommend that we use four levels. Here are the same 7 billion people again, the world population, and we spread them out like this. This is how the different income groups they belong to. And to describe the different income groups, level one is basically extreme poverty. One billion people live here. And if you're moving somewhere, you will have to walk. Level two, you will have access to a bike. Level three, motorbike. And level four, access to a car in some way. This is a very rough way, but it actually gives us some kind of a model to understand the world around us and the proportions. We also need to know where people live. So here we see the world map, the same 7 billion people, the world population. We have one in the Americas, one in Europe, one in Africa, and four in Asia. So to remember where people actually live, we can think of a pin code of the world 1114, easy to remember. But moving forward into the future, things will change. So there will be more people in Asia, more people in Africa. 2100, UN is, is expecting it to be around 4 billion people in Africa, 5 billion in Asia, but no changes in Europe and Americas. So splitting into the classical West that we know, right? We are going to be 8% of the total world population by year 2100. This is where things will happen, so it will be pretty important that we are behaving nicely. Otherwise, they will not really care about what we think, because we will be a minority. So the world population then, it's actually going to move like this, according to the UN. It's going to increase over time, but it's going to stop around year 2100-ish, more or less stop growing. And there will be no more children. How is that even possible? How can a population grow without getting more kids? Pretty weird. This is what's going to happen to the kids, by the way. This is how many kids women had in general until 1965, it was more than five. But then something happened. We learned how to control 
uh, pregnancies, and we got other ideals about families. We're almost down to two kids per family, and this is what people are expected for the future. Looking by region, we can see Europe fell pretty fast, Americas, Asia is coming, and we have Africa on its way, and this is the projected future. So the question still remains, how can population grow when the number of kids are falling? This is the answer. We call it the fill-up. Here is the world population today, the same 7 billion people. Imagine they live on different uh, levels depending on their age. So you have the youngest at the bottom and the oldest at the top. The first thing that will happen the coming 15 years is sadly that the oldest will die, the other ones will grow older, and we will get new kids. Grow older, get new kids. And see here, in 30 years from now, there will be 2 billion more people without more kids, just because the older age groups are smaller than the big ones today. But it's not increasing, it's just filling up. We call this the fill up. So this is how the population will grow. And also, a few people will get older. So it will actually also look like this. So it, it will be around 2060, around 11 billion people. I guess here, you're the kind of audience who knows who these guys are. Anyone knows who they are? Raise your hand. Yes, several hands at least. Not very many, but at least some. If I just give you the names, does it make it easier? Maybe not. These are the CEOs of Microsoft and Google. And what is interesting with them is, sorry, is that both of them are born in India, educated in India, went to university in India, and after that, they got hired to the CEO positions to lead these global brands. Because now big companies are global and they are easily run from Asia. So this is how the world population is distributed. And we could say, by breaking it down, we can say most people today are living on level two, on the bike level. But when we move into the future, this is what is likely going to happen. We will have fewer people on level one, and we will have the majority of the world population on level three, aspiring to get over to level four. So what we are thinking about as the consumer market of today is nothing compared to what's going to come. And we will have a lot of Satya and Sundars actually on level four deciding over the big corporations into the future. So when we wrote the book, the reason we did it was actually that we felt that people should actually have some general ideas about the world somewhat right. And Hans, my father-in-law, he's very interested in countries. So he said, why don't people just learn more about the countries because that's so fun. And we told him that for you it's fun because it's your hobby, but for most people they like to do other stuff. They like to hang out with friends, go to the soccer, you know, things people usually do. And he never really understood that. So we had to figure out ways of actually giving people some rules of thumb to actually understand the world better without learning it all by heart. So first of all, people need facts and frameworks. Without that, it's very hard to actually understand the world around us. And we try to provide that within the book and on our website. So the basics we think everyone should know. But most of all, we need to control our dramatic instincts. Because even when we're faced with correct information, we have a hard time actually uh, interpreting it in a, in a decent way, because our brains are interested in drama, so they have a hard time understanding the overall proportions. So we, dis we, we defined 10 instincts and rules of thumb how to control them. And I'm going to go through them very briefly now, because my time will only allow a brief one. But the first instinct is the gap instinct, where we have a tendency to hear about conflict. We, them, poor, rich, uh, you know, conflicting things. And when we do that, we should always remind ourselves 
that the majority is probably in the middle and it's probably not noticed. So just by doing that reminder, it will probably help us to stay a bit more sane. Then we hear a lot about stories being negative. It's just getting worse. And we hear as soon as something is getting worse, we will hear about it. But would an improvement get publicity? Most likely not. We never see things like this. Yesterday, all trains were on time again. I mean, that's not the logic. And when we see some trend or some line, we, our brains will fill in the gap that it continues the same way, even though many lines bend. And just remembering that many lines bend will help us to stay focused. A lot of stories are driven by fear, but we have to remember to calculate the risks because it's seldom the spider that will kill us, it's rather the car, but we will be afraid of the spider, right? And then we hear a lot about problems. It's a huge problem, we hear a lot, but we need to compare and divide. If we don't do that, we have no clue whether it's important or not. Here we have a number from UNICEF. In 2016, 4,489,000 kids under the age of one died. Horrible number, so bad. But it was actually worse in 2015. And in 1950, it was much worse. So remembering, by comparing and dividing, we can see that the number today is bad. It's horrible, but it's still better. It's bad and better at the same time. And we have the generalization instinct that we tend to group things and we can do it uh, a bit too easy sometimes. For instance, we've all seen these boats of immigrants crossing the oceans to get to Europe, and we know they are traveling in dangerous boats, risking their lives to get here. It's very easy that we group them as being the same in ways, without really thinking. But I read an article, a short one, so I don't really have the full picture, but I, it got me interested, in a Spanish newspaper about one of these boats succeeding to cross the ocean, get to the shore in Spain. Unfortunately, they ended up here on a nudist beach at Gran Canaria. And I'm just wondering, before they went into the dangerous rubber boats, crossing the oceans, risking their lives, had anyone told them that this is not the representative, typical European? There are other kinds of Europeans too. It's not only nude pink men with hats. So I think, <laughs> I'm just fascinated by, would they th feel that it was worth risking their lives to get here? I don't know. Then we have the destiny instinct, that we tend to think that the world is static, and countries and cultures and religions are always going to be the same. But that's not true. Most of them are actually in constant move. We also are very driven by our ideologies. But of course, it's better to have a toolbox. It's quite obvious, but it's still reminding us it's important. And we love to blame. Problem is, as soon as we start blaming, we stop thinking. So we should always force ourselves to think, is there any other explanations? And then we have maybe the worst one, that we tend to think that things are urgent. We're feeling emotional and we want to do something here and now, and we want to do a big change. But most often, we can take a step at a time and we can adjust as we go, and it's usually a better route. So basically, the whole book is a handbook where you actually go through these rules and learn to understand the world and get the frames and frameworks and facts in place. So maybe when we see the news, maybe we should have warnings like we do on the cigarettes to remind us that we have a hard time actually remembering the full picture. And we have already actually used these questions, the 13 questions. We have certified TV in Sweden TV stations, many schools, and this one, I would say, is my favorite example. This is a social entrepreneurship hub in Stockholm, and nowadays, they are actually asking people who want to stop wor uh, start working there, not only for their CV, but also if they have passed our test. 
with the questions because they, they seem to like to have uh, employees who know a little bit more about the world than chimps. And maybe that is something more could think about, that that might be a reasonable way of making better decisions. So if you want to reach out, you can find me here, Anna at gapminder.org. Our things are all free for anyone to use under open source and creative commons and stuff like that. You can just go here and grab whatever you like. We love to get more homes on Dollar Street. We have none in, in, in Finland, for instance, and we need more homes in all countries. We want to have at least 10 homes per country all over the world, meaning we need at least 2,000 representative homes, and we only have 300 today. So bring it on contact us and help us get more homes on Dollar Street. And you can follow us here if you want to do that. Thank you. Thank you.